We're going to talk about the transformation of lives, uh, specifically in the uh, area where God has placed you, and the area, uh, let's go a little bigger, in the city or town where God has placed you, and then we'll stretch that out a little bit also and say to the entire region. As a matter of fact, that's what we've titled the message today is Regional Transformation. Uh, the church of Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about the, just the organization. I'm not talking about uh, the 501c3 nonprofit. I'm talking about us, the church, and every other Bible-believing, Jesus-loving uh, church in this area. We have to, we must receive a vision However that comes, it could come from a speaker, it could come from uh, just an inspiration from watching television, it, uh, it could come from the Spirit of God himself, but we need to have a vision for reaching the people around us. And if, if we do not have that, if we do not receive that vision and then act upon that vision, the church of Jesus Christ in an area will just remain stagnant and go nowhere. And uh, I think we all are in agreement today that uh, time is short. Amen. Time is very short. Lord Jesus Christ will return very soon. We are in the end times, and, and uh, I'm, not a, I'm not an end time prophet, but I will tell you that you look around and you see things happening. And uh, we, I'll tell you this for a fact. We are closer this morning to the return of Jesus Christ than we were yesterday morning. And uh, as I shared with you a while back, uh, just like Jesus, I think we should all not be willing that any should perish, but that all come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So let's turn this morning to the book of Luke chapter number 10, Luke chapter number 10. And I want you to notice something here that a lot of people don't. Uh, a lot of people have read this many, many times, but they maybe have not really given it a lot of thought. And, and that is that when, when it came to reaching an area, and by the way, every one of us, and I preached a message on this back several years ago, I don't remember exactly when, talking about the sphere of your personal influence. You all and me, we're all influencers of someone. And uh, whether we're young, whether we're middle-aged, or, or whether, Brother Rodney, we're getting way on up there somewhere. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, no matter who we are or how old we are or how young we are, we all have a sphere of influence. We have those people that God has divinely, and I'll talk about this more today, but God has divinely placed us in an area in a specific time, and our place in, uh, in, in God's plan is that we would reach the people that he has uh, put there with us. And so, again, we're going to go to Luke chapter number 10. But when I, when I think about Jesus reaching his uh, area and broadening that out even, uh, I think about the fact today that he had instructions that uh, he carried out to a T, and those were instructions from his Father in heaven. I will tell you, and I mentioned this briefly last week. By the way, wasn't an awesome service last week. Uh, it was a great service last week. But uh, God, God sometimes, by his Spirit, gives us such divine plans that are so different from the plans of man. And I was talking to Joshua yesterday. He's 19, I guess. He's in college, and he's got basically his whole life in front of him. Uh, and uh, we were talking about plans. We were talking about what does success look like. And mankind can come up with, with his or her own plans and our own ideas of success. But it is the Spirit of God who gives us divine plans that are supernaturally charged. Right. He brings divine plans into our lives. And there are young people in here today that, 
they, like Joshua, and some of them much younger than Joshua, but they have so many things in front of them. And I will tell you, it is the plan of God in your life that you really need to focus on. Give God praise this morning, if you will, again. Jesus empowered people by his spirit. He empowered them and then he released them to go do ministry. Now, there are people in this building today, there are people watching right now that have been studying the Bible, reading the Bible for 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, 60 years, 80 years. Is that true? Is that true? Yeah. There are people that have been studying the Word of God for all these many years. And I'm going to tell you, it's time to take the Word of God that has been studied, has been learned, and go out and reach the lost. Amen. 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 So if you are born again, still breathing, living and walking in the Holy Ghost, I will tell you today that this, pa this pastor releases you to go out and win the lost to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. I release you to do ministry. I release you to go out and heal the sick. Pray for the sick and they will recover. Amen. I release you to pray for sinners that they would come to know Jesus Christ. If God speaks to you in the middle of Walmart and tells you, hey, you need to pray for that person for them to be healed, go pray for that person for them to be healed. Amen. I release you to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. You say, preacher, why in the world are you telling me all these things? Because so many people never have been told that you are released to go do the very things that the Word of God tells us we can do. Amen? So I release you today. Let it be known. I release you to operate in the gifts of the Spirit that God, by His Spirit, divinely wills that each of us, as He wills, would have happening in our lives. Give God praise today, if you will. I release you to rise above timidity and fear. I release you to rise above low self-esteem. I release you to rise above hurt and anguish. There's probably not a person in this place that hasn't been hurt in one way or another in their lives. We've got to rise above that, amen? Amen. You say, well, but, but yeah, I'm just who I am. I'm going to tell you, we need to get away from, yeah, I've got these, these issues, and well, I'm, I'm just to this or I'm to that. I told a couple the other day that, uh, uh, you know, many of you know this, but I am one of the shyest people that you know. I am, but a lot of people don't know that. I mean, my sister Lori and I, back when we were youngsters, we were probably this big. I don't re remember then, my twin sister Lori and I. I remember one day company came to the house and Lori and I, we went out and hid behind a burn barrel in the back of the house so that the company couldn't see us. Y'all know what a burn barrel is? That, some people... Avery, do you know what a... Y'all know what a burn barrel is? No, some people don't. It's kind of like an icebox. An icebox today is you just walk outside, amen? But we have all these things, but we've got to rise above these things. And here again, we think about, well, I'm to the, I mean, Moses, well, he couldn't talk good. We've, we've all got these things. Well, preacher, I'm too skinny to really be used of God, or I'm too not skinny to be used by God. My teeth are too crooked. My ears are too big. Let me tell you something today, and somebody ought to write this down. You are too called by God to allow somebody else to do your calling in life. Amen. As Donald Trump would say, that's tweetable today. Amen? The imminent return of Jesus Christ is upon us. Amen. We ought to have no more excuses. Maybe that ought to be a... Uh, not a New Year's resolution, but something to... How about a prophetic word for this year that we're in right now? Right. No more 
excuses. Let's say that to the audience. Everybody say it together. No more excuses. Amen. Give God praise again, if you will. I completely believe, though, that the presence of God can bring an area-wide, city-wide. Now, here we're from different places. We've got people from Hatfield. We've got people sometimes from Wicks, from Akron and north of there, people going east and people going west to Mountain Fort. We've got people from right here. We've got a large area to cover, and I believe that God has called us to be a part of the last of the end time revival that should be taking place right now. And when we begin to worship Him, when we begin to seek Him, live right before Him, and pray to Him, I believe God will allow us to be a part of the end time revival that He's bringing to America. Give God praise again one more time, if you will. For revival to take place, and that, I shouldn't even maybe use the word because sometimes the word revival makes a certain image come into people's minds or a video come into people. I don't know how God is going to bring the end time revival that I believe is coming, but I know I want to be a part of it. Amen? I want to be a part of what God is doing. But for that to happen, people have to get involved. We, as a church, have to get involved. People in the Bible, they got involved. Jonah got involved. Philip got involved. We could go through a whole... Jesus Christ got involved. Well, but that was his job. What if Jesus Christ, as he just came and that was his job and and destiny was planned out, maybe someone would argue, what if he just sat there like a bump on a pickle and never did anything? Jesus Christ worked harder to perpetuate the gospel than any human being that has ever existed on planet earth. He worked harder than anybody else. You and I, we need to be working hard today, amen? We need to be getting out and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. You say again, well, that was his job. Well, where exactly do you and I fit in the Great Commission? Shouts are drowning me out this morning, amen. We have a great commission, Elijah, that we've been given. We've all been given. We've been, Kenzie, you've been given that. Justin, you've been given a part of the great commission. Amen. Sarah, you've been given a part of that. We've all been given a part of that. So let's read Luke chapter number 10. After these things, verse number one, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also, and sent them two by two, he released them. Did you catch that? He's releasing them to do ministry. They're going before him. And sent them two by two before his face, in other words, before he went, they went, into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Verse number two, then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Jesus Christ said this himself. The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Watch what he said. He said, therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray, church. Pray, church. Every believer in Jesus Christ ought to be praying something similar to this prayer right here. Lord God, help us today. Help us because we need more laborers out in the field. There is a harvest out there. There's a harvest in the neighborhood where you live today. Amen. 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 Verse number eight. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. I like that verse right there. I like that one. Verse number nine sort of seems nonchalant. I'm sure it wasn't. But Jesus said, and heal the sick there. Do y'all see it this way that, you know, that God would really tell, Jesus Christ would really tell people, Sister Debbie, when you, when you go visit somebody or when you go to town, when you, when you go to James's, when you go to Chiquita's, wherever you go, uh, heal the sick there. Heal the sick there. 
he, he didn't tell him, he didn't say, why don't you go, if you see somebody that needs prayer because they have a need in their life, why don't you go back home and fast for six weeks and then you come back and see if that person's still sitting on that bench at Chiquita's and if they're still there, you pray for them. No. He said he sent them out and then he said, heal the sick. While you're there, heal the sick, verse number nine, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. I, I read this just yesterday and I thought, wow. Tell them, say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. There was anointing in the words of Jesus. His words, according to Scripture, were spirit and they were life. You and I, as children of God, full of the Spirit of God, our words ought to be spirit and life also. But he said, tell them, say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. Kind of gets back to where is the fear of God in our society today? I'm going to tell you, the same God that was living back there 2,000 years ago is the same God that has inhabited our lives and working through us today by His Spirit. You and I should be able to say, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Verse number 10, whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, the very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. And then he said, nevertheless, know this. What's this? Same thing, that the kingdom of God, what? Has come near you. The kingdom of God, even the people that didn't receive him, let them know, the kingdom of God has come near you. Verse 17, then the 70 returned with joy. I mean, they were happy. And they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. I pondered verse 18 for a while, even last night. And he said to them, he said to the 70, he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. It seems like just out of, out of nowhere. It wasn't out of nowhere. This is the word of God. And this was his life that he was living, walking, breathing right then. But Jesus said, after, after when he's talking to the 70, he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I wonder if all of them caught on to the fact that that didn't happen last month or a couple of years ago. That happened a few thousand years ago. But Jesus saw it because he is the word who is living and powerful. Give him praise this morning in this place. So he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And then he said, following that, he said, behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So Jesus is speaking here about transformation, the transformation of lives, people being born again, coming to know Christ, giving their lives to Christ. That's both powerful and that is both practical. He told them, he said, go heal the sick. Here again, it, it just seems so so simple the way he said it, go heal the sick, cast out demons, things like that. He tells them to do these things. And then he, he also tells, tells them that I give you authority or I give you power in another translation to do these things. Let me just, in, let me just info, emphasize to you, if you've ever had a tongue transplant, by the way, you understand what I'm going through today. Let me emphasize to you today that Jesus Christ has done all he needs to do for your salvation. We accept what he has done, and then we also receive what it is that he has given us by the power of his spirit, and then we go out to a lost and a dying and a hurting world, and we bring reconciliation reconciliation, we bring freedom, we bring everything, peace, we bring everything that God has done in our hearts, and we give that freely to somebody else. Give God praise again today. It is no accident that you are here in the very seat that you are sitting in this morning. It is no accident that you live in the home that you live in this morning. 
It is no accident that you live in the town or the city or the area that you live in because God has placed you there. I'm going to prove that to you here in just a minute. God has divinely equipped you and God has gifted you to do the things that he has already destined you to do. So you say, well, what, am I, what if I'm not doing those things? You ought to be. You ought to be. If God has called you to preach, preach. God's called you to be a missionary, be a missionary. God has called you to teach Sunday school. I was thinking a while ago about all of our Sunday school teachers that were in here this morning. I appreciate our Sunday school teachers, and I appreciate that it, uh, a large portion of our church attends Sunday school. Give our, our teachers a big hand if you would. Thank you so, so very much. Acts chapter number six to, or 17, verse number 26 says, and I want you to pay close attention here, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Watch this. And has determined and pre-appointed their, determined their, he has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Look at that. He's made from every blood, from one blood, every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of of their dwellings, pre-appointed times and boundaries. Do I believe that some of y'all moved here on purpose? I sure do. Do I believe that you're here today on purpose? I sure do. Do I believe that you have a purpose right here? I sure do. Do I believe that you have a purpose in your neighborhood, as I mentioned a while ago? I sure do. Do I believe that you have a purpose in the city or town where you, or community where you live? I surely do. Amen? It's time that we see the transforming power of the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ coming to pass in the places where God has put us. Give him praise again today. So your life, your life, my life, is directly connected to a particular place or a particular territory, even a particular people group. I talked a while ago about the sphere of influence that we have. Uh, you may teach piano lessons. You have access to people doing that that I have no access to. You may teach school. You have access to people, children, that I have no access to or little access to. You may do this. You may work at NEDEC. You have access, and you're surrounded by people that I don't necessarily have access to. So what do we do? We pray for those people. We pray for that place. We stand against evil. We stand up for righteousness, and we lay claim to whatever area. Somebody needs to hear that today. We lay claim to whatever area it is that God has placed us in. Amen? People today listening and, and people in this place right now, they have family members and friends who've been lured into drug addiction, been lured into alcoholism, into sexual sin, into, this is a big thing whether you realize it or not, into witchcraft and into rebellion. Individuals and churches today need to lay down our jealousy and our pride and we need to start working for a common goal and that is to see the gospel of Jesus Christ spread to our entire area. Amen. Give him praise again. So we need to lay claim to this city. We need to lay claim to our area. We need to lay claim to our families. We need to establish ourselves as the people of God. You know, I love it when people call the church or people call one of you and say, I need you to have your church pray because this person has a need or that person. I love when that happens because they recognize that we are praying people. We need to be praying people. Amen? Amen. We've got stuff going on around this area that if, if we just knew the depths of some of the things 
I talked about witchcraft a minute ago. I talked about alcohol. Do you realize today, if we even had an idea of how big the drug situation, we know there's a bad drug situation here. Most everywhere there is. But if we knew how big that was, if we knew how big the alcohol situation is, you say, well, we're a wet county now, and well, that should make it better, right? No, it does not make it better. By statistics, you know, there are people that say, well, you're better off. Listen to me today. There are people who say and argue that you are better off if you are a wet county because you just have all your alcohol home with you when you don't drive with it. That's a lie. There are people that argue that. People have argued that for years right here in Polk County until now we're wet. Well, let me tell you what another statistic is that nobody argues, and that is that when, when you're a wet county, there will be more alcohol in that county. There will be. That is a fact. Nobody argues that. Amen, somebody. I was looking at some statistics a while back. I want to, I want to give you these today. Listen to this. Alcohol is the number one drug problem among young people. We, we talk about meth and we talk about all, cocaine. We talk fentanyl. We talk about a lot of stuff. Alcohol is the number one drug problem among young people. Alcohol kills 6.5 times, or, yeah, more youth than any other illicit drug out there. The three leading causes, let, let me rephrase that, alcohol kills 6.5% more youth. If you've got a young person, be glad they're still living. The three leading causes of death for 15 to 24-year-olds are automobile crashes, homicides, and suicides. Alcohol is a leading factor in all three. Can I just talk to you all straight today? Is that okay? People who begin drinking before age 15 are four times more likely to develop alcoholism than those who begin at age 21. By the way, that is not some preacher telling you, wait till you're 21 to start drinking. <laughs> Youth who drink alcohol are 7.5 times more likely to use an illicit drug and 50 times more likely to use cocaine than young people who never drink alcohol. 75% of young teens say that alcohol is easy to acquire. Alcohol is implicated in more than 40% of all academic problems and 38% of all dropouts. Teenagers... Hear me and hear me good this morning. There is nothing good that comes from drinking alcohol. Amen. I've also got a word for the adults listening today. There is nothing good that comes from drinking alcohol. That is not a popular message at all, but it's the truth. Tell me what gets fixed by drinking alcohol. Some people get a little bit of a break before they pass out and then they wake up the next morning before the great white throne. Different throne than some of y'all were thinking about. But <laughs> I want us to realize today that God has connected us, divinely connected us to our area. And I've said it, I'll say it again. You are here, Riley, you have been placed where you've been placed on purpose. Amen. On purpose, amen? So I want, us, I want us to think beyond the four walls of our homes. I want us to think beyond the four walls of our church. And once we've reached our city, wherever we live, I want us to think beyond the four walls, if I can illustrate it that way, of our city Amen. or our town. Amen? Amen? So let's go to Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter number four. Uh, I want us to look at something here. 
Uh, and I want us to understand this, that Satan, and we're talking about areas and regions, towns, all this, Satan himself is very territorial. He's very territorial. You look at some of the things that happen in particular places, uh, even particular areas of the state of Arkansas, and you, you realize, wow, it's, it's, it's so amazing that one area can be so different from another area. Matthew chapter 4, verse number 8, again, the devil took him up, took Jesus up on a, an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And it, it looked good, okay, and their glory. Verse number 5, and he said to Jesus, said to him, he said, he said, all these things, I mean, just look, just look. All, he's talking to Jesus. He says, all these things. Oh, isn't that wonderful looking? All these things. Satan said, I will. <laughs> My goodness, Jesus is standing there. Satan's talking to him. Satan says, I will give you all these things. The maker of heaven and earth. All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. In other words, Jesus, why don't we just join forces? Why don't we just work together? Ultimately this, Jesus, why don't you just come under me and submit to me? Look at what all you can have. What did Jesus say though? Verse number 10, Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. I will tell you today, there's so much uh, temptation to have compromise, uh, all these things that come against. It's not just against kids. It's not just against youth. It's against adults too. There's so many things that want to draw people in. But I will tell you today that we are to love the Lord our God with everything that is within us. Give him praise again, if you would, this morning. Part of the, uh, part of the if I can use the word job today of principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, we could say Satan, uh, is to, again, control particular areas. And that may take the form of, of uh, poverty. Uh, I, I look at some of the, the Assemblies of God in the state of Arkansas have been working for a few years now to address the poverty issue in, uh, in the Delta area of Arkansas, in eastern Arkansas. And we've we put a lot of resources there. It's it's, a different, it's like a different world over there. Uh, we have things in our area too, but territorial things I'm talking about, and I, I think we have a lot of that kind of stuff here, but, but uh, control comes in the way of poverty. It can come in the way of, of really lots of religions in an area. It can come in the way of jealousy and pride. You could have areas that are really affected by sexual sin. Uh, part of that is what's legally allowed, and you know, we're living in a day Right now, though, where sexual sin happens every day on somebody's telephone. That's right. That's right. Because there's so much out there that is readily available right. to anybody that wants to have it. Do you just feel conviction sometimes? <laughs> Stuff like that happens in churches also. That's right. Amen. Amen. You say, well, there's nobody in this church that would ever do something like that. Really? If they're not shouting by this point, move along quickly. Okay, I guess we better. Y'all yeah, yeah, remember a fellow by the name of Saddam Hussein? He was a, evidently, he was a really rotten fellow. Had control over uh, the nation, the country of Iraq. He was a dictator. He stole from people. He destroyed innocent lives. He kept people bound uh, with fear. Um, he must have thought, this guy must have thought that his kingdom would never fail, but it did. Now, why did that happen? I will tell you why his kingdom failed today. Because brave and empowered men and women made a stand for freedom. Soldiers, young and old, joined forces with one another 
to see him be brought down. I will tell you today, you and I, as the church of Jesus Christ, we need to join forces with one another. We need to join together with the King of kings and Lord of lords. We need to see his spirit move through our prayer, and we need to see strongholds be pulled down, and we need to see the name of Jesus Christ lifted up in this area where we live. Give God praise again today, if you will. You and I have the greatest commander-in-chief that there ever has been and there ever will be. Amen? Amen? Jesus said this. He said, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. You know, the, the wimps of Christianity need to stand up and be counted. Amen? Amen. But Satan does. He places a high territory upon uh, high value in territories. And when we began to get in his business, the area that he's been, do you think Saddam Hussein was happy when people started moving? No, he wasn't. You think he fought back? Sure, he fought back. Everything he had. Similarly with Satan, when we began to take over territories, I will tell you, if we're wise, we will expect that there will be opposition coming our way. Amen. When you start witnessing, Dylan, in your school, you can count on it. There will be opposition that will come your way. You say, well, I don't want any opposition in my life. Well, you probably signed up for the wrong thing then. Amen, somebody. Amen. I've noticed something over the years that the enemy fights dirty. We could talk about car bombs. We could talk about people strapping bombs to backpacks and and uh, suicide bombers. I, I heard recently of, uh, back in October, of a terrorist group that started uh, kidnapping the innocent out of a nation called Israel. Amen. Kidnapped them, killed many, much worse things to others. And then they set up their camp in the basements of hospitals and schools where the innocent were at. The enemy fights dirty. The enemy is a coward in many ways, but he fights dirty. Let me share this with you today, that passive containment has never worked and it never will work with Satan. It never will work. Why do you think that Israel hasn't backed down. Israel has been, has been faced with all this political pressure from the United Nations, from the United States, from, the, from our president in Washington, D.C. Israel has had pressure to back down. You know, don't, don't cause too... Oh, I'm getting political on y'all, I guess. It's not even politically correct, is it? I'm really making a point here. You know, the United States is trying to get Israel to pull back from stopping Hamas. I will tell you today for a fact that Israel is in this thing to fight and Israel is in this thing to win and Israel will win this war. It makes me, if I can use the word happy, to know that they don't even listen real closely when our president tries to tell them what they need to do. Amen, somebody. Amen. I'm just letting you know ahead of time that when you set out to accomplish whatever God has called you to accomplish, it's not always going to be a smooth road. It's not always going to be smooth sailing. Amen? Amen. Amen. When, when we sign up for this thing, we join in and we're a part of the army of the Lord. We used to sing that in kids' church and when we were growing up, little kids' songs, you know, about being in the Lord's army. Mm -hmm. We're still in the Lord's army when we grow up. Amen, somebody. But I've come to tell you that when the enemy comes in like a flood, or when the enemy comes in like a flood, I will say the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Greater is he that's in me than he who is in this world. I'm going to tell you, you are a victor today. Hallelujah. So be ready for battle. Be ready for it.
It's going to come. I'm, not, I'm just telling you, don't go stick your head in the sand thinking that, well, I'll, I'll be just fine. No, there's going to be trouble coming your way. How many of you have ever witnessed to somebody and did ministry and all this stuff and never had trouble in your life? Yeah, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But when, when you sense Satan's attack coming your way and his opposition coming against you, I'm telling you today, stand firm. There are people that they start backing down whenever opposition comes. I'm telling you as the pastor of this church, you stand firm. You stand firm and you rely on the help of Almighty God that is always present and available for you. Always, amen? There are times when out of nowhere I get this, you get this, that bombardment comes your way. There are sometimes things just happen. I, I've used this illustration so many times over the years that there are times when your tire goes flat, <laughs> literally on your car. And I don't think there's ever been a time that I blamed the devil for that. I blamed a nail or a screw. I had a big hunk of metal one day, Brother Justin. I had a big hunk of metal one day, about yay long. It was a piece that had fallen off of somebody's welding truck, I guess. A jagged, probably that, probably five-eighths of an inch, yay long. And uh, I was coming in from a hospital visit, just coming, nearly got to town, coming in on 88. And I felt that boom, boom, boom start to happen. I looked, and, and I still had enough air. I thought, if I can make it to the church, I'll just leave it there. And uh, so anyway, got to the church that night. Pulled under the canopy out front, left it. That was Saturday night. Sunday morning, I got to church. I was ready to air that dude up, and on Monday, I'd take it down the, to, the, to the tire shop, or even on Sunday, I could have taken it to Walmart. I got there, and Brother Justin, he was such a blessing. He didn't change my tire, but he pulled out that big hunk of metal that was in it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the devil's the devil didn't do that somebody dropped something off their truck but there are times that the enemy comes against you you just stand your ground as a child of God I'm telling you don't cower down don't retreat don't give up don't quit Amen. write this down mark this down in your knower today you were reborn to fight and you were reborn to win. You were reborn to fight. When Jesus Christ, you accepted him into your heart, he forgave you of your sins, you were born again, you were born again to fight, and you were born again to win. Amen? My help comes from the Lord Jesus Christ today. How about yours? Give him praise again this morning, if you will. Let's go real quick, 2 Kings chapter number 6, and we'll wrap this up. 2 Kings chapter number 6, the, uh, the king of Syria, most of us remember the story. He sent a, a great army to capture Elisha, the prophet, and they surrounded, this great army surrounded the entire city. There was, there was no way out. There was no way out. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15 says, and when the servant, when Elisha's servant, when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out. So they were sleeping. There's probably another sermon in that somewhere. When the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, he saw there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to Elisha, he said, alas, my master, what shall we do? It almost sounds like to me, and I, I wasn't there, so I can't say for sure what was in his mind. It, it was either, what are we going to do? Or, what shall we do? We're surrounded. You know, we, we kind of choose if our glass is half full or half empty sometimes. I don't know for sure. Verse 16, and he answered, he said, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Every time you find yourself in a situation where the enemy seems has surrounded your life, 
You remember Matthew. You remember, it says, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, opens it, open his eyes and he may see. Then the Lord opened, his, opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. I'm telling you, we serve a great God this morning. Give him praise. Stand with me, if you will, today. My hope and my prayer this afternoon is that, number one, that, that this is not just a New Year service, but my hope and my prayer is that we all get challenged to, to win those in the area that God has placed us, that we do everything that we can. We're challenged to do that, and that in the process of this journey, that we would always remember God is my help, God is my strength, God is everything to me, amen. You can trust him in the face of adversity. Father God, thank you for this day that you've given us. Lord, I thank you today for, Lord God, everyone who is here and those that are watching. Lord, I thank you that, God, you've allowed us to have a great time of worship, great time of uh, being in your presence this morning. Pray, God, right now that as we prepare and as Catherine comes out from the nursery, even I pray, God, that you would, uh, in these next few moments, let it be a special time of just first reflection upon who you are to each of us, Lord, and also, God, just, uh, God, just knowing that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, we pray today, God, that you would just be glorified. I pray that you would equip every believer in this place and every believer watching. Lord, there's some watching today that, Lord, are in other states that, God, you have blessed them, you have empowered them, you have equipped them. And so, Lord God, may they feel the call today just to be released into ministry. Thank you, Lord God, for those that, that are already doing that. Thank you, Lord, for those that are already doing that. But may we all feel today the call to do whatever it is God has placed upon our hearts. We thank you for that in Jesus' mighty name. With no one looking around, I just want to ask quickly, is there anyone here today that would say, Pastor, I need forgiveness before we change the order of service. Pastor, I need forgiveness. Would you pray for me? Is there anyone, is there anyone that needs forgiveness today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Are y'all blessed this morning? Amen. 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 Give God praise. Yeah. You're on your way to heaven. Well, headed there, not at the moment, but go ahead and be seated for just a bit, if you will. Uh, come on up, Elijah. Thank you. 